gosh. I don't know what this word is. Do you know what this is? Can we skip it? I don't know. It's <laughs> we can always cheat. Couldn't we have something like water? <laughs> I know we're out of practice. I guess we're supposed to do it, right? A part is that somebody from Armenia? Oh, that's a great. Yeah, Parnassus. Is that in Armenia? I don't know, but I A N is oftentimes an Armenian. Um, oh, thing. the adjective Parnassian originally meant pertaining to Mount Parnassus, a mountain in central Greece on which Delphi is located. Okay. Oh, oh, I didn't read about pertaining to poetry. Yeah. What? <laughs> Delphi was sacred to Apollo as the god of prophecy and the god of music, which he shared with the muses, the goddesses of music, poetry, drama, history, and dancing. Okay, this is a stretch and a half. I mean, me. what, are we just going to whip one into a sentence? <laughs> I really like your Parnassian skills. <laughs> I know. What, what pertaining to poetry because it's uh, the Delphi and Apollo and the muses and the- I mean, I mean, I, don't you think that's a long, long way to go to yeah, connect I mean, Parnassus to poetry? Oh, that's this is helpful. 60% of Greek words have no relatable etymology. <laughs> and then we have to come up with a story. With no relatable etymology. <laughs> teachers on a train <laughs> okay all right i guess we're doing it right because well we're... unless you want to cheat and i can go back and we can look up another word but you see the date and everything is already on this i think we're stuck okay i think we're stuck my Wait, mind but... is filled with parnassian stories right now i know i don't think i ever even heard this oh i just thought of one all right, so let's, we'll take 60 seconds since we're 30, drawing we're blank. Doing 30 seconds times two. So, right, maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, putting the timer on for, I'll do one minute. Here we go. Okay. I love the whole Oracle of Delphi and all that stuff. And uh, there, there's there's a couple of movies, I, which of course I can't remember the names of, that have done really interesting interpretations of sort of uh, uh, almost small cults that that's, that smoke a lot and, you know, are bombed half the time, but they're the ones who are seeing the, the future and the past. And it's all very mystical and interesting. However, I don't like believing that our future is fixed. And so I reject the whole thing. <laughs> All, we're now done right done with parnassian okay did you see the the movie a mighty wind it's yeah a, yeah with the folk singers yeah and jennifer coolidge plays that strange sort of marketing lady and i think this might have been an outtake they're at a party and they're all standing there. And one of the guys is like, so have you ever played a musical instrument? And she goes, yes, my friend asked me if I like to play the piccolo and I said, no. <laughs> Just brought it to a halt, that conversation. So Terry and I said, this reminded me like, oh, I love the Delphi's and everything, but I don't believe in any of it. And we're like, <laughs> it's over, it's no more. That's okay. what you say, and I said no. <laughs> <laughs> you right, and you could just see the people around her going, you know, trying to figure how do we interact with this. But when it goes, mean? I've always been a bit of a model train enthusiast, and she goes, Yeah, thank God for model trains. Oh, absolutely. You know, if they didn't have the model train, they wouldn't have gotten the idea for the big trains. so funny to me <laughs> they didn't use her much in the movie but oh, oh well we, we have, can't take those have, kinds of if we didn't have that we wouldn't have the big, <laughs> the big one, one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a legitimate line of thinking 
<laughs> if we didn't have the stuffed animals, we wouldn't have the big one. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm so glad we have the baby carrots. <laughs> Many years ago, back in the 1990s, when I was working in a corporation that was really good about sending us to trainings and conferences and different things, um, <clears throat> I got to go to this um, uh, sort of legendary compound gorgeous old hotel in new hampshire somewhere and i think it was used as the the um uh it's sort of inspiration for the shining <laughs> oh. I know. You mean not the one in colorado it was in, it was in new well well this this hotel was in no in new hampshire right and it was a big old fabulous you know pile of bricks kind of thing with porches and and I, why because i think originally in the winters you just they couldn't use it it was wow. more of summer resort and so they had caretakers and stuff like that that would come in the summer um and the shining was written by by stephen king wasn't it and he mm -hmm. lived in maine so gotcha. so that anyway means, okay this has actually nothing to do with the Parnassus story I'm getting so to. Far. This is the hotel. This is the hotel. And it was in the summer. So it was beautiful. And it's it's this um, sort of Victorian hotel. And it turns out not terribly renovated. You know, you could hear all the clanking of the pipes and the walls. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, this is charming. Yeah. Like, you can't sleep for the week I'm there. But uh, so, so all the people that were there, it was, it was a systems thinking conference, I believe. And so it was um, Peter Senge who wrote the fifth discipline. Yeah. And um, I think Daniel Kim, who, who had started the systems thinker newsletter and, and sort of uh, intelligence network and, and all just Margaret Wheatley and these new, oh, the new son, all these fancy people. Peter people. Yes, leader people. So like, you know, uh, leading thinkers, new ways to approach the world. And there they had um, this poet named David White, W-H-Y-T-E. And he had David written a White book. Was there? He's hot. My love, this is exactly where I'm headed. Oh, no, no, not like it's a bit. You, you're foreshadowing. You are foreshadowing. <laughs> so he, so remember, this is the 90s. So he, all of us are a lot younger at that time. <laughs> right. Not just a few of us. <laughs> not just a few of us, but every one of us. Yes. I've never seen him before. I have not read his, I don't, I know nothing about him. Didn't know he had that accent. I did not know. <laughs> He had that accent. We were so in trouble. So he comes out, you know, with his dark hair and he starts speaking in this Welsh, you know, it's like, is that Richard Burton's little brother? What <laughs> Bobby. <laughs> Bobby and Dickie Burton. <laughs> His little brother. Bobby Burton. So. So this voice, and he starts quoting poetry, and then he and then he repeats the line, so that you get it, and he feels it as he repeats it. And I am telling you, your little Parnassian got a little hooty tootied. I would say all the Parnassian female, and probably half the male, we're all getting out our keys to throw on the stage to say, "Come." meet me after. I mean, I think maybe some panties were thrown up there onto the stage. It was crazy poetry contests, uh, poetry concerts. It was a romance novel, you know, happening in front of us that was lust ridden from the, sen from the first sentence. I mean, a, a beautiful man yes. with a beautiful voice. And speaking. beautiful writing. And then he's, oh. and then it's, if it's not hot enough the first time, and then he repeats the sentence. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> just to make cool. sure that it went all the way through grief. you. Those who do not throw the cone, throw the coin, throw the coin to the well of grief, well of grief, well of grief. And you're like, Parnassian gasm. Those Parnassians, I call them precious. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> that was good. That was good. And it was in that hotel. Oh, so I remember that very happily. That's better. That's because the word seems so cultivated. Yes, and and distant. It matches your story. (laughs) Well, so he remains in my mind, one of those kind of matinee idol, larger than life, emotionally resonating humans you know that can just create a mood um with language and intensity of feeling and the beauty that he is in his voices i mean just talk about you know um being a vehicle for art and expressiveness and yeah. uh, just so so beautifully done and then he created a whole movement of a bunch of straight white men in dockers and bad shirts who thought they could write poetry and then just repeat the lines like he did. Oh, really? Oh, I don't know if it was a movement. It's just I'd go to a reading and there'd be a guy and he'd say, I was walking down the street, walking down the street, walking down the street, walking down the street. And it's like, let me guess, you like David White. You're not. Let's get it over with. Catching him. <laughs> Yeah. David White, what did you start? Yeah. I got another, just a quick one to tell you that there was another conference I went to and it was more um, uh, formal. You know, we were, there was a stage and we were in the, the the one at the hotel was very much sort of casual tables and uh, we were- Close enough to throw your panties. You had room to get them off, you know. (laughs) Not that I know from personal experience. (laughs) But uh, so this one was a little more for, and um, and this this guy wasn't known as as a poet, but he told the story of, um, there's like an Arthurian, one of the legends where one of the, the knights, he gets to marry a woman who is either ugly in the daytime, but beautiful at night for him, or beautiful in the daytime, so everyone else can see her as beautiful, but ugly at night for him. And so there's a spell and he has to decide. (laughs) It says horrible, right? It's horrible. Is it like, do I want want to be seen with somebody like that? Or do I want the... Exactly. Which side of your ego do you want stroked? Thank you, darling. So this story, so, but what's kind of cool is the knight goes, what do you want? Meaning her. Yes. Thank you. Thus breaking the spell. Did she say she wants to live in a hut in the woods by herself? (laughs) (laughs) Please, dear, and... (laughs) Hydrangeas. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. That's no. good. He supposedly gets his reward, as does she, that she stays young and beautiful all the time. But <laughs> because he re- because he loved her or was honorable n- enough to say, I can't make this decision for you. Yeah. You know, he was that was so he was honored for that. So he, yeah, so young, beautiful. It's Parnassian uh, justice. And this, you know, dweeby MIT uh, intellectual told the story and it was beautiful. It really hit the audience in a lovely, lovely way. A few months later, I see him somewhere else and he's going to he's going to tell the story again. And he starts taking off his suit and underneath it, he's got like later hosen. He's got a costume on to tell the story. 
And all of us are like, oh God. What does that have to, what does hidden later hosen have to do with the story? I think he was trying to be a storyteller or maybe it was a Swiss story or I don't know what the, but he so overproduced it. Nobody, he did, you know, cause I think he thought he was going to bring the house down. Oh, cause he did that one time. He did it one time, but it was the genuineness with which he told the story. And so then he puts on this whole big thing and he's like, I'm going to wow you. And all of us were like, and by the way, <laughs> wearing later hose and under my suit. It was the weirdest. And so no panties were thrown. Yeah. Yeah. They, they stayed and home. So there's this, I, I, I'm just fascinated by what is that? What is the energy between the audience and the performer mm. where if it's too studied or it's too prepared or it's too fake or it's i'm walking down the street i'm walking down the street i'm walking down the street you know oh it I doesn't see. it yeah. doesn't connect right i think david white did it because i mean i've heard him perform and it just seems very natural and it's tied in with his words and 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 then he's got a certain style rather than just copying him yeah yeah there's some because eric and i look at actors that way right is looking at what who has an internal life that is that comes through them there's some energetic even on film um, and who's who's doing the the facsimile version yeah yeah mm. so so i just am always interested uh because it feel it feels so unpredictable but in some ways you can predict it was over engineered. It was over managed. It was over something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What Parnassian stories might you have, my friend? I was a little more literal. No, I love that. I was in high school and somebody told me a limerick. They wrote it down. It really struck me. Or maybe they just told it to me. I can't, I can't remember who told me. So as many of our stories, as you remember from previous stories, I went to a Catholic high school and in junior year, junior year, we had New Testament with Father Batterberry. And we were, I don't know what we were doing. We had the Bible and we had the, we were doing our little homework assignment. And I decided Lenny Rudis, who's, uh, her name's Eleni, but we called her Lenny. Lenny Rudis and Cheryl O'Brien were sitting behind me. And I decided to write down the limerick and pass it to them. So we're all having silent cop, whatever we we're doing in the Bible and writing down, <laughs> right so I pass it and they go. <laughs> Father Batterberry gets up out of his chair. Oh, that's the first comes Whoa. walking down the aisle and I'm just like so <laughs> and he yanks the piece of paper out of their hands and he turns and he's walking back to his desk and he's walking back and he's going <laughs> he's laughing he laughed and he didn't say anything else and the two he, they didn't get in trouble nothing happened I just oh brilliant are you ready for the limerick Okay, so it made two teenage girls laugh. It made, it made the teacher the laugh. Boy, laugh first and think this is a good idea. I'll pass it to them in class. Let's in share New it. Testament Bible study. <laughs> Dead silence. It was boring. I don't know what we were doing. Something. And they go. Ah! <laughs> and then Father Batterberry. And then has Father Batterberry, who could have gotten, we might have gotten demerits or whatever. Bad and news. Laughed. And we always, you know, I knew, I'm sure he knew who wrote it because I think You're, he knew our handwriting. Sure. Sure. Ready? All right. All right. Okay. I'm ready. There once was a man from DePaul who had a hexangular ball. <laughs> the cube of its weight times his dick size plus eight is his phone number. Give him a call. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so stupid! Like <laughs> the cube 
cube of its weight times his dick size plus eight. <laughs> his phone number. That <laughs> made him laugh. And Father Ben <laughs> just decided to roll with it. <laughs> I will Whoa. never forget that limerick, but just that moment of like, I don't know why I expected them to have more control of their life. <laughs> no, well, that's how stupid we are when we're teenagers. We don't but think- how stupid. I mean, I knew even in that moment, it was a hit. <laughs> why did I think I could write it down and pass it silently? <laughs> Well, I love that Father Battenberry was so cool. I know. He's like, no, wait a minute. Really cool. This is actually a funny poem. This I'm letting it ride. I was a senior class uh, vice president the next year, and he was this like the student leadership advisor. So we worked a lot together. And then I brought I brought it up because I was so shy around him for like a year because of it. Right. And he goes, you don't need to say anymore. <laughs> It was pretty damn funny. Like, let's just be done with it. I'm yeah, not... let's. <laughs> we have a piece of cord around that. Let's not discuss it anymore. Be... I was just sitting there sweating, sweating. And throughout, oh. he had like 20 more minutes of class. And every so often, he'd give a little chuckle. Whatever he was doing up at the <laughs> Give him a call. A call. Well, I'm like, OK, that, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Hey, guy from DePaul. I heard he had a weird testicle. <laughs> just, oh. Sometimes that, I think of it, the logic in that poem is so strange. I, I know. Well, you know, somebody was high when they wrote it. it oh, I know. Backwards, DePaul. Maybe they lived in DePaul. What else could they say? <laughs> right. Oh. I actually, I love limericks. Uh, and I used to, you know, sort of write bad ones a, 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 as a form of entertainment for myself. It's good practice. And there was one, there was, I wish I could remember it exactly, but I used to work with a guy named Jim Menzies, who was from Scotland. And <laughs> I found one. There was, there once was a man named Menzies. You wrote it? No, 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 no. I found it. Yeah. I found it. And I, so it's like you. Why did I bring this to his attention? No. Oh, but it no. was something like there once was a man named Menzies who one day lost his contact lenses. Okay. He went searching, you know, and ended up between the legs of Leslie's or something or something horrific. But something you wouldn't necessarily these days share with a colleague. Absolutely. <laughs> or, a, or a priest <laughs> in your high school. And so I just remember, like I brought it, I said it at a staff meeting or something, thinking, isn't this hilarious? And everyone was like. Bad. Oh, God. Just like yeah. the guy with the later hosen. Just like the guy with the layers. And I realized I'd embarrassed him, you know, because because yeah. I thought it was funny. Because to me, the Scotsman I know, the Scots people, the Scots are hilarious. Yeah. Every one of them just cracks me up. So I thought he would think it was, you know, hilarious. <laughs> well, there's all no hours. I don't I don't always have good boundaries. Well, and there's one, um, there was a young woman named Rhonda, and like she was in love with her Honda, the blah 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 things she wasn't so fonda. I uh, like that kind of you know, where it's a little wordplay on the end. So is there something about being Irish Catholic that limericks that are really maybe. dirty? Maybe fake Catholic, but maybe. Well, yeah, no, I mean, you went to school, you know, you were in the. Th that one, no, I heard from, for, it could have been. I, I don't, I just. That made... one, that joke, I know I'm repeating it, but it makes me laugh so hard. There once was a man from DePaul who had a hexangular ball. 
the cube of its weight times its dick size plus eight is its phone number. Give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid that is <laughs> wait i'm trying to figure out his number i can't figure no, i'm like I, yeah, we go. I got a graph I, I, going <laughs> there once was a javelin thrower who practiced by throwing a mower he tripped on a stump his head hit a bump and he wasn't a thrower no mower Oh my God, that is adorable. It's cute, isn't it? He wasn't a moa no moa. He wasn't a thrower no a moa. thrower no moa. Yeah, that's what he needed. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. <laughs>